I think visually. And as a writer, I see the movie in my head and then I write down what I see. The danger of that is you start trying to dictate the director's vision of the movie. Okay. The key is, and I think one of the things Sandy was, was talking about, which of course n none of us wanted to believe back then, you know, that there is a dividing line between the writing process and the directing process. I went into CalArts wanting to be a director, not a writer. I made my living as a professional screenwriter. I had n that was completely accidental. I never wanted to be a writer. Nobody who goes into film school wants to be a writer. God, I mean, you want to make movies. I just happen to be good at writing. So that line between w what I've realized in you know working in the professional mainstream is that line between writing and directing is often a very finite line. And what, uh, some of the things I've learned, which I think Sandy was trying to tell us, is there is a place for r defining the vision of how it's actually going to be presented on screen. And that's not necessarily the writer's job. However, uh, I work visually, I see the scenes, I write them down, but I never, ever r suggest camera angles. I never mention the word camera in a script unless it's a tourist taking a snapshot and I have to describe that he's holding a camera. Never, ever do that. It's the mark of an amateur script if you try to do the director's job on paper because I guarantee you any director who's any good will completely ignore it and maybe even resent it and not actually get what you're trying to say on the page. Most young people at that moment who were coming to film school you were usually coming from a kind of technical mania more than from a kind of storytelling tradition where we weren't a kind of byproduct of a theater group first. We were a byproduct of some kind of m mad comic book photographer animation something. It was a product of a lonely childhood spent in an attic more than an extremely gregarious childhood of plays and theater. And what that begat you was people who were, and also the movies that inspired us were high, highly technical. The movies of the 70s that, catap that were there during my teens were, were by kind of, and I think this was true of most of the students Sandy was encountering, at least during the decade I was, was kind of in and out of CalArts and around, was that we were all the products of Kubrick and Spielberg and Lucas and Coppola and this kind of technical mastery was so insane on these movies. It was kind of the new development was how incredibly well mixed and, you know, um, and incredibly well composed and controlled these, these kind of movies were and modern in their sense of kind of sound and image. And it made every young filmmaker want to make sure their script pages in a way guaranteed that you understood from the moment you sat down to read my script the way I'm using the drip of the faucet in this scene and the way I, like they did in The Servant and the way I'm going to be using the sound of the helicopters like Coppola did in Apocalypse and you, will, you because of what inspired you you were going out of your way to sell that and if anything was getting a short shrift it was just what the hell is going on here you know what is this about what is the scene about? What is, what is your once upon a time story? And Sandy had a unique kind of challenge with all of us, which was that we were all very appreciative of that lesson, but also terrified of becoming what we all saw as hacks who told stories but didn't do it in some stylish or definitive way which at that moment in film culture, all of our heroes, Marty Scorsese, Steven Spielberg, Coppola, Lucas, as I said, Kuk, um, Kubrick, the king of them all, were somehow, uh, in, to at least a 17 or 18 year old's mind, asserting style over necessarily an aggressive story or narrative first. And that's a very long way around saying that most of us were writing scripts where we were just m with sharp elbows making sure you saw what auteurs we were going to become. And what Sandy's point, I think, about that was that we needed to do the work of telling a story and justifying the rolling of all this film. And he was both a welcome and unwelcome voice that way. I, I, and a, after having spent time in acting school as well, I think it's, it's no different than a young actor kind of immediately grabbing a pipe and growing a mustache and starting to play with research of, of how people in the military in the 40s handled their revolvers all before they know what their character wants. And that we're in a rush as young artists to kind of 
produce the surface and the feeling of a performance, or in our case, as filmmakers, a film, more than necessarily know it from the inside out. And we're in a rush because we're young and impatient, and that produces a kind of, um, that produces those kind of scripts. The, having said all that anyway, what Sandy was up against was trying to get us to see a story first. And it's not the kind of message you want as an 18 year old to hear. It's like kind of being told to make your bed. It's, it's like kind of being told before you go running outside, you better make sure all your shit is put away in the right place. What I encourage students to do is to think of a feature length idea and then to summarize it in four double space pages of prose um, and not go into elaborate visual detail or anything. And that's just to get the structure and to look for the building blocks in their own story. Because it's the easiest way to see if the structure is there. If their idea is flushed out, what are they talking about? Because by the time you get into all the other stuff, uh, you know, thousands of scenes and, and dialogue and character development, it's, it's so, you think you have a story. And if your ideas are unclear, those unclear ideas are now embedded like in concrete in these characters and you think your characters are great, they're speaking to you, you have a whole emotional reaction and it just isn't there, you know, it's, it's sort of like a version of the Rorschach test, you know, you think you're seeing things and nobody else has got it, you know. So it's very important, the hardest thing to do is to make sure that what you think you're saying is what you're actually saying. It's very easy to have a whole film in your mind that never makes it to the page and never makes it to the screen. And so I do think that uh, before you get involved in all those delicious things that you think are just great filmmaking, that style stuff, you better get it on paper in a simple way and you better make show it to other people. Make sure that what you think it's about and what you think is happening is actually there because most of the time it's not. And that's... That's not just student filmmaking. That happens in a lot of feature films. I'm not a very good editor, but I know enough about the editor's problem that I don't think I'll ever give the editor footage that he can't cut. Or if I do, I know it. And, you know, I apologize for it because there are some, some problems. So the business of planning, the edi editing, after all, is a process that, again, starts really in the writing. Uh, the, Editor, uh, uh, the, the editing, and to some extent, not perhaps the cutting, but the editing is, <laughs> is in the writing, and in the acting, and in the directing. Uh, so again, the editor has to, um, to do his own individual part of the job, has to follow through the others. There's some evidence of this, interestingly, in, in those uh, cases where, as most, unfortunately, I think, and perhaps inadvisedly, most students really try to be their own uh, writers, directors, and editors. Uh, and as I have said, fail to learn um, the craft because of this. But when you are a writer and a director and involved in the editing here, uh, you are three different people. At the stage where you finish your work on a script, a screenplay, and start to work on a shooting script. A screenplay and a shooting script are categorically different. The screenplay is something written from the writer's point of view who is imagining himself in a theater watching the screen up there from a shooting script is somebody thinking of himself on the studio floor seeing where the camera will go and there's an absolute division between screenplay and shooting script so that if you write both if what you do is that you write a screenplay then having got the screenplay you say that's it put it down go away put on another hat and come back and said what is this that the man has given me make a differentiation between that if you try to write a shooting script when you should be writing a screenplay, you're bound to run into trouble. Because that's what too many students do. Students coming to Karl Arts, unfortunately, uh, feel it necessary to write only because they want to be directors and are insecure about accepting the work of some other writer. It's very understandable, but it is their problem. The shooting script is when the 
director and possibly also the cinematographer and the set designer and the other technicians have taken the script that's been given to them and started to break it down and say, OK, here we need a cut, here we need a close-up, here we need to track or dolly, and they start turning it into the blueprint for the film. And even then, it's still only a blueprint. It's no more complete than an architect's blueprint is a finished building. The complete thing is the film. What Sandy's fear and loathing of the shooting script did for me was convince me that I rarely will write kind of camera direction per se in a script myself, even though I'm the filmmaker, meaning that I'm not even having to worry about turning off the filmmaker by doing it, but I find it a turn off in that it actually takes me out of the story. That if you want to describe a close up of an actor, describe the color of her eyes and that they're red and that there's a tear welling in the corner or that there's or that the way her lids are trembling or the way her bangs are blowing all tell me I'm not in a wide shot and in a way even if I wasn't the director of my own script are much more um, passive-aggressive way to actually get the director to shoot the scene the way he saw it because instead of literally issuing orders to him, wide shot, the house, Catherine walks from left to right, who cares if she's walking left to right? What is important to you? That you see the screen door slamming and feel the wind blowing her skirt? Say it. If it's sexy to them in a way, if it grabs you as a reader and a director, you'll make sure you feature it. You won't, that won't be a head and shoulders shot of that actress crossing that porch if the way her dress blows is something that seems truly evocative and relevant to the story. So always, I'm, I'm rarely referring to a lens or a tracking shot or a, I'm just referring to what do you see? If I were sitting next to a blind person in the movie theater, what would I say to them? I wouldn't go, it's a 27 millimeter lens tracking low. That means nothing. I mean, if I were describing something to my grandmother and she couldn't see, I would be describing, um, he's walking down the hall, he looks really powerful. Well, that's a low tracking shot. But in the language, in the immediate language, that is also a better sell to get it made and, and a more inviting environment for an actor or director to work. It's only recently, in the last 100 years or so, that we had the technology to be able to create the cinema that we've always had. So that if you read uh, uh, you know, literature in the way that you would read a script, you see there have always been scripts. I mean, for instance, although it's, uh, you know, this scene you know, doesn't figure in, uh, in the recent uh, uh, Iliad, <laughs> but there is a scene in the Iliad where the way that it's written, you see shots. And that is when, when Hector goes you know, uh, um, to meet Achilles. And uh, Homer focuses on Andromache. She's in, a, in her room in Troy. Troy shakes. Something extraordinary has happened. So she goes out onto the battlements, and she sees the body of her husband, Hector, being dragged behind the you know, chariots of Achilles. And she falls down to the ground, and the cap rolls away. Now, every single one of those you know, sentences is a shout. Now, you know where it's a mid-shot. I mean, she's in her room, mid-shot. She's sitting down, you know, we, where does she come from? Motivation, what is she like? We're closer to her, a full shot. The hat, well, we see, we get even closer to see that she's got her black hair with the cap and blah, blah, blah. She, Troy shakes, long shot of Troy, boom, the whole wall shaking. She goes out, long shot of what she sees. You cut back to her, full face. She falls to the ground, medium. We see her whole body, right? You then cut back, uh, as the uh, cap or the hat r rolls away, you end up with color leaving her life completely because the, her future is black. So you end up with mostly black hair with perhaps a bit of the face. You see what I mean? I mean that is the kind of writing that a good screenwriter writes because you know, they, they see things not exactly in shots, but they see things in, in, kind, in emphasis, in emphases. Uh, so that it depends what is the subject of the shot. Is the shot the expression on the face? Is the shot the place where the person finds themselves? Is the shot because of the action and so on? 
so that it comes naturally to a good writer to write like that, and that is cinema. If I can't describe camera angles in this great crane shot, how do... Well, you can suggest proximity. If you're talking about James as a dot on the horizon of the desert, that's obviously not a close-up, right? You're not telling the director to shoot three miles away with a 50 millimeter lens, but you're saying, you know, he's a dot on the... Or if you say, you know, his eyelid twitched, that's obviously not a long shot because you can't see that in a long shot. So you can suggest a kind of emphasis of the visuals. Or you can say things, uh, I mean, it's perfectly acceptable to say, we follow James into the room. I, I mean, if it's that's part of the flow and the pace of the piece of the movie, I mean, sure, that's fine. But you don't say, you know, we track laterally beside, you know, you just forget all of that. Note that you're trying to do the director's job. The job of the screenplay is to get the movie made. Someone with money in their pockets reading it needs to go, I want to make this movie. Someone who is an actor needs to read this script and go, I want to be in this movie. There, either if the, it doesn't do those things, then the movie never becomes a movie. It is just a text. There's the dry role of going, this is a scene that takes place interior diner night. You know, the whole existence of slug lines can't have anything to do with ease of readership. It's about the most awful thing to have to caress with your eyes in existence. It is merely a, it's a product list of the shit you need. I'm doing a rain scene at night, interior diner. What shit do I need? I need to light the diner. I need rain bars on the windows. I need, these are the, that's, so it's fulfilling that other logistical act of making a film. I think that what Sandy was always trying to get us to do was not think about selling and not think about the logistical act of making a movie, which was intoxicating as young people. It's because it's the fun, it's the equipment, it's the, it's the romance of making a movie is, is the shit I'll need. The, the lights, the rain bars, the, the car to crash, the fireball, whatever it is, that's the fun. The hard work is, and the fear of your own abilities is, can I make this human moment happen on this day in front of this lens at this, in this hour? I think one of the um, saddest things these days is that there is a, a growth in the publication of screenplays which are not screenplays. That the vast majority of books that you see on the shelf in your local bookstore that claim to be screenplays are actually post-production scripts. And that whilst the script for a film is something that we can all learn from, uh, the post-production script tells us nothing, except it puts on paper what the film is on the screen. Any real screenplay that you read, if it hasn't diverted significantly in the first ten pages from the film that you've seen already, then it's not the screenplay. Um, this is even, even more true, of course, of films from Eastern Europe, because there was, and I think still is, in, in the former Soviet area, um, the tradition of writing the story first, of writing a narrative form of the screenplay. And I've always thought that this is something that, um, that should be adopted everywhere, because telling the story is, in a sense, far more important than listing night exterior scene 33, you know. And this, of course, connects very strongly with, with Sandy's belief that you, know, you shouldn't write a screenplay until you're ready, and that indeed getting the story right is far more important than putting your screenplay into the, the uh, conventional form. It's far more important that people see the film from the page rather than know where they are because it describes uh, whether it's night or day, whether it's exterior or interior, um, and where it is, which in a sense creates a kind of very um, difficult to read object. Um, because in a sense you're more absorbing information which is of use to the producer and the accountant than of use to the filmmaker. He would advise them to try to write the story or tell the story first. He was opposed to students writing in screenplay form because he thought it inhibited them in terms of their uh, thinking visually. The, the most obvious thing that they would do is they would begin to write dialogue because that's the easiest thing to do. I don't recognize it's the job of the screenwriter to do X, whereas it's the job of the director to do Y. I think 
I've worked with a lot of wonderful actors. Um, my job in relation to helping them deliver what they need to on screen has been completely different with each actor. I doubt Sandy's experience with Tony Curtis was at all similar to his experience with Burt Lancaster. And yet they were on the same set doing the same job. Therefore, when you talk to me about kind of what the screenwriter's job is, with one, if I were writing for Sidney Lumet, my job might be one thing. If I'm writing for Stanley Kubrick, my job might be another. If I were writing for John Cassavetes, I might have yet another completely different job. What should a script be? Well, you have to say, well, who's writing the script and who is it for? Is it a director writing it for himself? Is a hired writer writing it for the studio? Is he one of 20 writers who have written it? All these scenarios are different. I think of a film like Strictly Ballroom by Boz Lerman. I went and saw that movie, and I tried to picture when it was done what the script looked like. And I think if I had read the script, I would have thought, this is not even forthright. This is really a piece of crud. But he wrote it for himself. He knew what he wanted. If you look at that script, what's fascinating about it is it is pretty damn cliched. But what he had a feeling for, if not a conscious understanding, is the meaning, the added meaning, which is significant, most of the meaning comes from the close-ups in the film. He turns relationships and events around on a dime, and it's all done in close-ups. He tells the story in close-ups, so it's not even on the page. It's the most simplistic, contrived, boy meets girl, boy wins dance contest. But just look at the film. He knew where the film was being written. It's written in the close-ups. It's one of the most brilliant uses of close-ups I've ever seen. The screenwriter's job is to define the story, the characters, what's at stake, how that escalates, those big building blocks, which, by the way, directors often lose sight of. So the director's job is completely different, and the best you can hope for is that if you define those writerly elements in a script, that a good director will actually sense the necessity for them and not monkey around with them too much. You have a lot of people reading your scripts that aren't really screenwriters, they're not really directors. They have a, a, a master's in business, you know, these, these are the people that are in the positions to progress your script or not. So you want to make it as readable as possible. And also, so, you know, sometimes people, sometimes directors are insulted by the fact that you're suggesting, you know, specific shots. So a lot of scripts, and a lot of people write scripts that are more like shooting scripts because when you go uh, into some of the places where you can buy sc screenplays and so forth, what you're getting is a script that's been developed on down the line. It's really a shooting script. So, you know, by emulating these shooting scripts, a lot of people shoot themselves in the foot because they're never going to get past a reader. It has to be very, very readable, it has to be very, very succinct and, and minimal. It's, it's really about minimalism in a lot of ways. How can I be as succinct, as minimal as possible, yet tell the story? If you read a script and it seems absolutely right and it's very full, then it's not going to work. Not absolutely work. And if you read a script where there seem to be gaps, then, the, then it's, it has a good chance if you have a very good director. It has to, you have to have some space for the director to fill. Otherwise what happens is the director is simply illustrating the script. Uh, you know, and when you illustrate a script, you cannot put yourself in it. You have to interpret it. You have to imagine it beyond what you see on the page. And a good script is like that. I mean, if you read a really good script, it's, it seems sometimes remarkably empty. I'm talking about a writer who writes in a way that invites the actors and the director to enter into the creative process with them. And the, and the only way to do that is to be extremely economical in how many words there are on the page. The more action you put in, uh, you know, the more dialogue you put in, the less room you are leaving for the contribution of the director and the actors and the DP and the editor eventually. What's really hard as a, for a writer is to decide which words ought to go because less is more only if it's the right less. 
If it's not the right less, then it's just less. You want to get out of the reader's way as much as possible. Create an, imp create an impression of the movie. Don't try to carve out every technical detail because it just gets in the way of the reader's experience of the movie in their head. Above all else, story came first. And he took it a step further. That there ought not to be anything there that in any way uh, obstructs or, uh, what's the word for covers over, uh, obscures in any way the, the story being told. So that he carried it into the realm of economy. That there should be a certain amount of stripping away, dialogue especially being cut in favor of, of imagery and, and, and cutting. Um, unnecessary shots being eliminated. You don't really need that establishing shot. You don't really need that master. Uh, the editing process, in my experience, is at its best a process of attrition. That, in a sense, you, you take hold. It's like, a, it's like a tree that has fruit in it. You take hold of the trunk, the trunk being the, the main thrust of the story being told. And you shake it very hard. And whole scenes fall out. Uh, whole blocks of dialogue fall out. All kinds of shots fall out. And gradually, what you end up with is the good stuff. Uh, the narrative, pure and unadorned. And that's what, it's that purity, it's that, that distillation that gives it its narrative power. Sandy was trying to teach us, and I think it's a lesson that I'm always horrified by in the, in the public, is that people don't understand what screenwriting is. That essentially, that what you're watching was written. And that somehow, despite the fact a movie is such a more elaborate construction than a play in the ways that it's multi-locational, multi-angular, capable of getting internal, photographing dreams, um, in an instant moving from place to place, time to time, that still all those decisions seem like filmic decisions. Someone, a director's decisions. And that essentially people view, and I think very often students come to the table and did with Sandy, the act of writing as a dialogue list, as an act of making the things, crafting the things people will say. But the act of shooting and making the movie and what you see first, second, and third, who's doing what to whom, who's in the room already, who's entering, these are decisions to be made elsewhere or by filmmakers. And the, I think Sandy wanted us to make these decisions on the page. My job is to create a vision of the movie. I know that the, the audience for my script is a handful of executives, maybe a few movie stars, and a few directors. That's who's going to read it, right? This is not a vision that's ever going to end up that way on the screen. The, t the, screen the script is a tool to attract a filmmaker and to attract stars. From there, it sort of changes, and you hope that you've woven the fundamentals into the DNA of that script s s boldly enough, strongly enough, that they're obvious to other people, even if they interpret those fundamentals in different ways. Here's an idea, hand it off to the director. Directors have to digest that and, and sort of see the sense of it or see it their way and then put it down in the form that's going to end up on the screen. We live in a, in a film culture where the, the writer is very often from the beginning attempting to protect themselves against the director in the sense that they're trying to direct the film through the writing of the script. On the reverse side of that, directors will come into a process where, as a producer, I've spent a year and a half developing this script. And through all the politics involved in doing that with the, whoever's paying for it, until the script has finally been greenlit, and then a director comes in and in a matter of days starts restructuring and rewriting the script in a way that I would never have been allowed to do um, as, as the producer, or the original writer wouldn't have been allowed to do. 
so our, there's, an, there's a sickness in the, in the structure of our film industry uh, where there is this sense that uh, writers need to protect themselves and need to protect their material. They're not always, they're very rarely welcome on the set. Uh, the whole collaborative spirit that Sandy spoke of has to fundamentally be in the relationship of writer and director. If the, if the collaborative spirit isn't there, it really can't be anywhere else. If you had a, a script and you gave it to someone to read as a piece of literature, it, it shouldn't stand on its own. Because if it is able to stand on its own, then there is no need for a film. The, the film will add nothing to it. It will simply be illustrating the script. If you were to take a scene, you know, shall we say, out of you know, Bicycle Thieves, which has a scene in it which is exactly one minute long, which is when you know, the man comes home to his wife. He is absolutely disconsolate. He's been given a chance to work out of hundreds of people who've got no jobs, but he needs the bicycle to do the job, and the bicycle has been pawned. And she, in this t t tiny scene in the flat, goes into the bedroom and very angrily takes the sheets off the bed and an old sheet out of her chest of drawers. She's going to pawn the sheets. It's impossible to describe on a, in words. You have to see the film. Every moment of that one minute scene is about the relationship between the two and about telling us about her character and about his character and the relationship you know, between them and the social you know, situation. Everything that you need to know about those two and the hole they're in and what uh, human courage and human resilience is about is in that one minute scene. Now you couldn't take the scene from the script and transmit that idea. You couldn't. You would have to write something else. You would have to write a poem. You would have to write a literary poem to be able to capture those elements because if you describe just what happens it's incredibly crude and misses the point completely. It's, it's not about what happens, it's about some magical thing that the film does with the scene. poetic phrasing, especially when the poetry has an imagistic quality, um, you can see, um, in the same sense that the best of cinema feels poetic. So there is, there is a way in which we can, budding filmmakers can gain nourishment, and nourishment is what they need, uh, from examining the way Stories have been told with images, even when it's in literature. You know, Sandy started as a production designer. So he was a visual thinker, then became a writer, then became a director. So um, he, he would often explain his process 
as one where he visualized the set, the location, the geography of elements within a scene. And the one example he would use uh, was Guns of Navarone, which he called Guns of Navarone. It was critical in his thinking of how that story would play out, that the geography of where those guns were and the paths and the obstacles leading to those guns was laid out to him as a writer before he could plot out the steps of the story because it was about geography. It was about take, you know, a war story about taking you know, an objective. So he had very detailed sort of breakaway sketches of where these guns were inside the mountain and where the, the entry doors were and where the guards were and, how, and what it would look like if you saw it from down below looking up. And all of that was very carefully planned, but that was part of his writing process. Now, he intended to direct the movie, and in fact was supposed to have directed the movie, but got fired. So he was thinking ahead to the writer part of, uh, the, the director part of his brain uh, being helped along by the writer part by figuring these things out ahead of time. The script as a receptacle, the script inviting the energy of the other makers to come in and live here and stew so that the script should, in a sense, excite, should motivate, should arouse, but not impose, not specify uh, unduly. Part of what Sandy was trying to get across to his students, I think particularly when he was talking about collaboration, was the way, as he saw it, that the scriptwriter and the director should work together. Sandy very rarely took writing credit on his films, but this wasn't because he wasn't interested in working on the script. On the contrary, he saw it as an essential part of the director's job to work closely with the screenwriter on the script, but not because he felt the director should in some way correct or improve the screenwriter's work, but because the director's imagination will be fired by what he reads in the script. He once mentioned the example of a script that he had been given where, as he read it, he said every line of dialogue, every description conjured up a new image, a new framing in his mind. Sandy was insistent that if you knew editing, you knew how to do everything. And, and he was absolutely right about spending time in the editing room, which I did because I didn't necessarily want to be a director, I was happy to edit. And I learned all aspects of filmmaking. He was absolutely right about that. And the importance of editing for me came into play when, then, when I then began to write, I realized that I was selecting every shot, the size of the shot, whose point of view it was, and all of the edit points without ever alluding to the camera. You're supposed to follow this rule of one page per minute, so how do you decide when to skip a line? And, you know, that big revelation of you skip the line when it's the next shot. And that's something, you know, that I do now. Each shot gets its own line or, or couple of lines. And it makes the writing process so much easier because you are seeing it. And when people read my material, they always say one thing, I can see the movie. And that's because I've fed them every image without ever mentioning POV, angle on, camera, any of that stuff.